Oh, and actually we're at 256 or uh, 250, we're past 255. Okay, so um, welcome back everyone. Happy Monday, it's been a long Monday. Yes, it has indeed been a long Monday. I'm right there with you. Uh, so my goal today is to make good progress towards finishing chapter three, which is on alkenes. Uh, and we have two more class days with which to do that today and Wednesday. Uh, on Friday, I plan to start chapter four, I think, which is on aromatic compounds. But of course, that material will not be on exam number one. That'll be in exam number two. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you. I always like to leave a slop day just, uh, just uh, in order to, um, in case something happens. Is the exam during class time or any time in the 14th? Well, my hope is that at least the vast majority of the people take the exam during class time. Uh, there's always things that happen. Uh, my intention also is for all of you to take the exam, if you are intending to take the exam. Now, I don't want you to lie and come up with some cockamamie excuse. I'm sure no one would, you know, but, but I understand there's always unexpected things that happen. Uh, and probably one thing I should say, though hopefully it'll be less true for you than for 227. Uh, one thing we need to prepare ourselves for is we should expect things to go wrong. There's gonna be some things that go wrong. Uh, my plan a week from today, by the way, is after my second 227 class, I'm just gonna go home and, you know, by the time the exam opens, I'm gonna be sitting there with my email open just to put out all of the inevitable fires. I just hope there aren't many. One of the main issues I, I remember learning last term is that if I put figures on the exam, you know, pictures or structures or something like that, I don't know why this is, some people can, uh, can see them and some can't. And I don't know why that is. So I will make those available in some other means. And I, I, I learned to put on this structure uh, or actually I would put it in the question since the questions are going to get randomized somewhat. But I'll say, you know, the question will read, see figure such and such, and it will be marked that so you know which picture to look at. But that, that was a weird thing. I don't know why some people uh, couldn't see it and some could. Uh, where are we at in the notes? Uh, put it in a separate tab for, oh, that is smart. I don't know if I'm able to do that. Uh, I mean, I know I can leave them on the campus for you to download. That's not a problem. I wish I knew how to do that. I guess genetics professors are just next level. Uh, where are we at in the notes? So uh, I'm going a little bit out of order for, uh, for um, uh, chapter three. I've, t I've, I've covered all of the structural stuff, the hybridization stuff, which we'd covered before. Today, I just want to finish up on one little idea in terms of nomenclature, which gets us to, um, da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -dun, which gets us to the reef session for today. So the, uh, there's no question, uh, it's just 10 points for attendance, but I wanted to set you to do a little uh, um, uh, exercise, so. Everyone, please make sure you register your attendance. And these are your problems for today. And we'll just take a couple minutes. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, you downloaded. Okay, well, maybe we kind of mean the same thing. I guess you could do that. Uh, yeah, I probably could make it, I guess, if it were in a PDF file then you could make it so that it's just there on a separate tab. It should work out pretty much the same. Mine isn't popping up. Uh, there's no questions today. As long as you can see the, uh, in other words, you just, get, uh, you just get 10 points for attendance. Just register your attendance on Reef. I'll try to make it so that we use Reef polling at least once a week so that you get your money's worth for using it. But yeah, this is just for practice. You don't get any points directly for doing the questions. It's just automatic 10 points if you're here. Notice another thing, by the way, if you know how to name uh, alkanes and cycloalkanes, then you 
automatically know everything you need to know to name uh, alkyl halides. If you can handle cis-1,3-diethyl cyclopentane, then you can handle cis-1,3-dichloro cyclopentane. There's not a single extra thing you need to know. You've, you've got everything you need. Alkyl halides get thrown in for free. And of course, this will especially, this will eventually rather be up on eCampus, probably later today. Timer says two minutes, I'll let it go to three. But to continue answer the quest, answering the question about where we are, I mean, it should be in the syllabus. But after we take care of this last little structural issue, by which I mean the E and Z business that you get from chapter five, I'm moving that uh, ahead in chapter three. I think it makes more sense here. Uh, once we take care of that, then we're going to learn how alkenes behave, uh, alkenes behave, what kind of reactions they undergo. And spoiler alert, they're all addition reactions. So they all have something in common. There will not be a review session in the sense of my having a session in which I come in and tell you what's gonna be on the exam and just spend an hour going over those things or whatever. I've tried giving review sessions in the past and people just don't come. So uh, I've decided to, years ago, I decided just to have more office hours on average than my colleagues. So, uh, this question is, is not on reef. It's only attendance today. Yep. Uh, so, so I have my office hours, what, tomorrow, Thursday, and Saturday. And if I need to do another one on Sunday, I will. But I'm not going to a dedicated session in which I sit there and say, these are the things that are on the exam. I'll be happy, though, to take any questions from anyone. All right. Well, hopefully you got something like unto these. This is not the only correct way to draw that compound, but you do need to use wedges and dots, wedge and, wedge and or dot bonds to show that the chlorines are cis to one another, that they're either both up or both down. You could just as easily have used uh, uh, dotted bonds. Someone in my, uh, we had something like this today in 227 and someone asked, do you have to show the hydrogens? And I'll, I'll go with this. Everything shown needs to be shown. Anything not shown does not have to be shown. You can, if you want to put a dot bond to H over here and another dot bond to H there, it's fine. You certainly can do that. But if you don't, they're understood. Remember, that's how line angle drawings work. So any variation on that is fine. Uh, but yeah, everything shown needs to be shown. Anything not shown does not have to be shown. This compound here is 2-methyl, two 2-hexene, two 2-methyl two because the methyl group is attached to carbon 2. And remember, I was kind of nice here. I made all six carbons in the main chain go, you know, out and out straight like this. I do not promise to do that. And you've probably noticed that owl will sometimes be evil in that regard also. Oh, speaking of owl, I got uh, an email from exactly one sharp-eyed student. I'm surprised no one else noticed that the chapter four owls would have been due this Friday before we've completed the chapter. That of course was an error in my part. I moved it to a week later. I always intend for owls to be due the Friday after we finish a chapter. And you can usually tell when that's going to be in the, uh, in the syllabus because it lists when we're going to do things. So, uh, so only chapter three this week. Yeah, we're, doing, we're finishing chapter three by Wednesday. We're starting chapter four on Friday, but we're not going to finish it. And again, chapter four is, uh, is not on this exam. That's exam two. So we have no owl due until next Friday. It might be. Uh, maybe we'll have a bye week already. Sometimes you guys will get a bye week. Uh, anyway, so here we have 2 methyl 2 hexene because the methyl group is on carbon 2 and also the alkene starts at carbon 2. The reason we don't call, we don't have to use cis or trans is because as soon as you have a carbon with two groups that are the same, they don't even have to be two hydrogens. They, but as soon as these two groups are the same, game over. There's no distinction between cis and trans. Yes. Uh, well, a methyl group at carbon three while still having the one on two or just moving it over. So adding a, a methyl, well, that would then be two, three dimethyl, two hexene. 
there is no cis or trans. As soon as you have any two groups on either of the alkene carbons that are the same, by the definition we gave last time, there's no cis trans distinction. Now, if you moved this over there, then what would we do? Then we might be in an E and Z situation. So, that, so we're going to cover that today. In other words, when you get to a situation where you cannot know whether it's cis or trans, we have a solution to that. And we're going to cover that today, and I'll show you exactly how to do that, step by step. So that comes later. But if it's just an extra methyl group, I would call that 2,3-dimethyl, 2-hexene. Okay, uh, so that'll go up on eCampus, but uh, while we're on that topic, trying to give myself a segue here, might or might not work. While we're on that topic, uh, so we have 2-methyl-2-hexene, that's the compound we just talked about. Uh, without the methyl group, now we have trans-2-hexene and cis-2-hexene. We defined that the last time, and I went through a step-by-step -step method showing how you can know whether a double bond is cis or trans. So these two are different compounds. They're stereoisomers, and we defined stereoisomers the last time also. So, so they need two different names. So this is the trans-stereoisomer, and this is the cis-stereoisomer. And you can't convert one into the other. You can't rotate around a double bond like you can around a single bond. So this is, uh, this is the compound we just had, 2-methyl-2-hexene. There's no cis or trans because we've got two of the same group on either of the alkene carbons. As soon as you do that, there's no possibility for cis and trans. But what if I did this, which is similar to the other compound you asked. What if there were another methyl group down, down the line? Well, now we've got a problem. Now cis and trans fall apart. Uh, now the whole rules for cis and trans don't work. You could say this chlorine is trans to this probal group, or this methyl is cis to that probal group. That would be correct. But as to the molecule as a whole being cis or trans, it's not going to work. And that's where this EZ system comes in, discussed briefly in uh, in uh, chapter five, but again, we're moving it forward into this chapter. And in order to know whether a double bond is E or Z, you're gonna do something similar to what we did before. You might find it, uh, if, if, you, if it helps you to give yourself a visual aid by putting a dotted line down the double bond, you can do that, it's optional. If you find that helpful, go ahead. What we're then going to do is compare it, well, okay, I'm trying to do this step by step. Pick one of the two alkene carbons. Doesn't matter which you do first. Pick one of the two. And what you're going to do is compare the two groups that are directly attached to it. So we have a hydrogen here and a carbon over here. And then what you're going to do is compare atomic number. I'm going to go CF for compare atomic number. which again, I'll always see to it that you have a periodic table. So a lot of these common elements you might wind up memorizing. So we're looking at this carbon and we're comparing these two elements. There's a carbon here, right? And a hydrogen over here. Carbon is element number six. Hydrogen is element number one. The carbon wins. So if you want, to if you, if you want a visual aid to give yourself some notation that that's the one that won, it's kind of like playing war. The higher card wins. Over here on this carbon, we've got a chlorine and a carbon, right? And so the chlorine wins. If the two elements are the same, then you need to move out one notch. So if you would say a methyl group and an ethyl group, well, the ethyl group would win because that's gonna have an extra carbon that the methyl group does not have. You don't need to worry about going all the way down the chain and not being able to decide. You don't need to worry about that happening to you. Because if it does happen, then you've got two groups attached to the same carbon again, that are the, uh, two groups that are the same attached to the same carbon again, and game over. There's no cis, trans, or easy. So you don't need to worry about that happening to you. It's not possible. You will always be able to make a decision. If, if the two groups are the same, then there's no E or Z, just like there's no cis or trans. Hopefully that makes you guys feel a little bit better. That trick is, is, is impossible. I couldn't do that to you if I wanted to. 
Owl will be owl, but I couldn't do that to you if I wanted to. Okay, uh, so where was I? So the, here, as we have it here, the chlorine beats the carbon. And then you observe where the two groups that one are relative to one another. And if they're on the same side of the double bond, then you assign it, then you assign it the Z configuration or Z if you swing that way. If they're on opposite sides of the double bond, like they are here, then we assign it the E configuration. And uh, this is one of those cases, if you're one of the few people who like me took German in high school, or actually for all I know, maybe some of you heard it spoken at home. If how, however you may come by it, if you know any German, you just won the internet. This is one of those places where it comes in handy because the Z stands for zusammen, which means together. And the E stands for entgegen, which means over yonder in the other side. Uh, I've heard, I think I might have told you guys this the other day too. I've heard it said that some people remember this with the mnemonic device Zame Zide. Drives me crazy, but I will admit it's effective. It works. So this compound we would call, let me see, carbon one is here, carbon two, uh, eine, uh, eine Bretzen. Yeah. I, I forget, forget if pretzel is masculine, feminine, or neuter. Oh, well. Is it feminine? Die Bretzel? I can't remember. One, two, it's been so long. Three, four. I was in Speyer on the Rhine in what was at that time in the 1980s called West Germany during the Bretzelfest. And you'd better believe I went and got me a Bretzel. Absolutely. But not a beer. I was too young. I hate beer anyway. Uh, all right. So one, two, three, four. So I think we will want to... That's a two. Although you'd be hard pressed to know it. Carbon one's over here. Four, five, six. So it looks to me like we've got a chlorine and carbon two. And that's it. So I think we would want to call this E... 2-chloro, two 2-hexene. Two 2-hexene two because the double bond starts at carbon 2. You always put the number where the multiple bond starts, no exceptions. 2-hexene. I think that's it. Yep. So you, you can't really use cis or trans here, but E and Z take care of that problem. Now, I do want to point out that it's never mandatory to use cis and trans. It's perfectly fine to use E and Z in those cases, too. If you wanted to call trans 2-hexene E2-hexene, perfectly fine. Absolutely correct. No problem. And then cis 2-hexene would be Z2-hexene. No problem. Completely acceptable. But uh, we need E and Z for cases like this one where it breaks down, especially tri-substituted alkenes and tetra-substituted. So I've get, I've, the steps that I've mentioned, the step-by-step -step method, are in the class notes. But I, but I think it's worthwhile learning that now while we're still talking about alkenes. And that, I think, is basically it for that. That leaves us half an hour to start to cover. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, so some people know it. That's good. Uh, okay. Uh, can't think of anything else. That's pretty much all we have time for in terms of nomenclature of alkenes. Any questions on any of that? I see no comments yet. Okay. We'll go with that then. Are the steps in chapter five? I think I put them in the class notes for chapter three, since I've moved that forward. Uh, they're pretty similar to the steps you use for cis and trans anyway. Main thing to remember is to uh, distinguish by atomic number. So that, that's the main thing. Okay, uh, that leaves us uh, two class days to cover reactions of alkenes, uh, and then at least touch on the, uh, the issue of Markovnikov's rule, which is a thing that exists. And I also want to brush us up on uh, reaction energy, equilibrium, 
reaction rate, just a, re a real quick thumbnail review of all those things. That's my plans for today and Wednesday, uh, as I like to say, God willing, and the creek don't rise. So um, uh, main thing that you need to be aware of is that uh, alkenes undergo addition reactions. Now we said that alkanes would undergo substitution reactions with halogens. We talked about radical chlorination and radical bromination, and we talked about how many uh, monohalogenation products might be possible. There could be one or two or 20, and it just depends on the structure of the starting material. But that's a substitution reaction because you had two bits that were switching places. So one of the H's on the uh, alkane was switching places with one of the halogen atoms in the halogen molecule. And so you got a halogenated hydrocarbon and either HCl or HBr. That's a substitution reaction. In contrast to that, alkenes undergo addition reactions with all different kind of reagents. And as I think I might have told you, I'll be darned if your book doesn't have every single one of the many reactions that we cover in Chem 227. I think that's outrageous. Most of these are things you'll never need to know about that I can see. And, uh, you know, just learning some of them, I think will give you the idea. But uh, addition reactions, I would say in general, are of the type where you've got two bit, two or more bits coming together and making one big one. So it's like A plus B yields AB. So two things come together and make one big one, or three, or however many things, but at least two. And what's going to happen is there's going to be some reagent that I'm just going to symbolize as X, Y for now. And I'm leaving this alkene, I'm, I'm leaving that unspecified as to what's bonded in those two alkene carbons. They can be hydrogens or other carbons or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's true for all alkenes. And in the end, you would expect to get an addition product that looks something like this. And as you can see, what we've done, ooh, that's a terrible bond over there. So what we get is that the double bond turns into a single bond. And on those two carbons that were formerly alkene carbons, we get the two parts of whatever it was that added. And basically what we're about to learn is some possibilities for X and Y over here. Let me try to count how many we're going to do. We're going to do halogenation, hydrogenation, hydration. These are important ones because these ones show up in uh, biochemical pathways. So they're not done just in the lab. These occur in living systems. Uh, we'll do addition of acids, HCl, HBr, HI, and H2SO4. And that's it. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I mean, there's sub ones under this. There's like three or four different reagents here. But I honestly, I think that's enough. If you understand those, th those are, are the most common ones by far to run into. I, I really can't see how it could do you the slightest bit of good learning about hydroboration, oxidation, and ozonolysis, and oxymercuration reduction. Oh, my gosh. We could die already. Uh, I mean, if I thought there were any value to you in your learning them, we would do them. But I'd rather stick to just these few. It, th they're the most common ones and, and the ones that are most analogous to what occurs in living systems, too. So I think they're the most um, uh, um, relevant. So I've made all that clear in the class notes, which parts you'll be responsible for and which not. But I think that's enough. Halogenation, uh, hydration, hydrogenation and addition of various acids across alkene double bonds. So let's maybe first do halogenation. So this is sort of like your general alkene addition reaction. They're all going to be of that type, and they're all going to have that kind of uh, end game. You'll get addition products of this type. But do you see how that falls into the category of A plus B yields AB? You just get one big one at the end. So they're all going to be like that. Uh, and, and even if we did all those six or eight other reactions, they're the same too. But I think learning these four that are the, the uh, most accessible will give you the idea plenty well. So let's start with halogenation. 
we've said that alkanes will react with halogens, and that's true. They will undergo a substitution reaction, but alkenes also react with elemental halogens. And so it makes sense that we would call that halogenation of alkenes. And the general reaction, here again, I'm just being very general. We'll do some examples also, one or two examples. In a typical halogenation reaction, you're going to treat it with either elemental chlorine or bromine. We'll say X equals CL or BR. We have incidentally the same type of problems uh, with F2 and I2 that we did with alkanes. F2 is much too reactive. It would just tear the molecule apart. You wouldn't get any controllable addition to produce uh, you know, just one product. It would be a huge mess. And I2 is the opposite. I2 is too unreactive. It does not react irreversibly with alkenes. But chlorine and bromine are just right. So we'll use Cl2 or Br2. Um, let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, often a solvent is also added. Uh, you, you'll see that mentioned in the textbook and on OWL questions. Uh, good solvents for this reaction, just so you recognize them when you see them, tend to be things like chloroform or dichloromethane. That would be a good choice. Chloroform happens to be trichloromethane. But generally, some small uh, halogenated molecule, either CHCl3 or CH2Cl2 are quite common, something like that. So this is not going to react. That's just a solvent. That's, that's not going to do anything. This is going to dissolve everything. And in the end, you can expect to get a product of this type, where the double bond becomes a single bond, and each of the carbons that were formerly alkene carbons get a halogen atom on them. So something like that. So an example of what you might have to know is, let's say you take cyclopentene. I could take any alkene. I just picked that one because it was the first one to come to mind. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I just lied to you. The first one that came to, maybe I'm about to lie to you, but I like this lie better. Maybe instead of that, let's just take one pentene. Here's an example of an alkene. But you might be given any alkene. You might even be given an alkene you've never seen before. And uh, this I have definitely in the chapter uh, uh, three class notes for all of these reactions, I have given you step-by-step -step methods to, to how to draw the, stru the correct structure of the product. So let's say that we treat this with chlorine. I could just as easily have picked bromine. And let's say today we feel like using dichloromethane as a solvent. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do or do not see written as the solvent is not going to affect the reaction. All you really need to know is what's the alkene and what's it reacting with. And so what you do is you turn the double bond into a single bond and you look what halogen you've been given. These steps are in the class notes. And you use one atom of that halogen on each of what had been the two alkene carbons. So I would expect to get one, two dichloropentane out of this. And you don't need to name it unless it says to name it. In general, you need to do everything it says. You don't need to do anything it doesn't say. Uh, especially watch out on OWL for that. You have to be sure to follow all their sometimes many instructions. Your exam, you're not going to run into this because it's multiple choice, right? The answers will be there. Uh, but anyway, so that's what you would get. Uh, I could also imagine you being asked to do the opposite. Something is treated with chlorine and you get this. What alkene did we start with? What was the starting material? Well, you look where your two halogens are, pull them off, and put a double bond where they were. So you should be able to go in both directions. But that's what it means to know these reactions. It means if you're given any alkene, even one you've never seen before, and one of these reagents that, uh, that we've talked about, it's going to be those four classes of reactions, then you can figure out what the product looks like. Or if you're given the product, you can figure out what the starting material must have looked like. That's what you need to be aiming for. That's what it means to know a reaction. Not memorizing particular examples. 
because what if you get one that's not one of the examples you memorized? So that is what I think you should aim for. And yes, for all of these, the matter of CL is pointing up or down in carbon one, not in carbon one. On carbon two, we will start to worry about that in chapter five. Welcome to chapter five. That's, that's a stereochemistry on sp3 hybridized carbons. Uh, as it turns out, you would get both up and down here. This answer here, I think, would be acceptable. But remember, on your exam, you're going to see all the everything you need in order to come up with the answer. But since I, since I can tell people are curious, you would, in fact, get both. You would get uh, chlorine up and chlorine down. The reason you don't need wedger dot here is because this carbon is a CH2. So there is no issue of wedges and dots there. We'll learn in chapter five, this carbon is not chiral. So there's no issue. This is just fine drawing it this way. You could even write CH2Cl. That's fine too. So uh, um, now we'll go back to our cyclopentene. If we treated that with bromine, in whatever solvent we feel like, maybe chloroform. Uh, what product would we expect? Well, again, the double bond becomes a single bond. That's the first step. And then on each of the formerly alkene carbons, you'll put an atom of whatever halogen you're given. And like, ooh, sin unto me. I mustn't forget my lone pairs. At least not for the first exam. Let's be careful to draw on all the lone pairs. After that, we'll start to relax that a little bit. We'll just draw them in only if we really need them to, to communicate something in particular. So likewise, if you're given this and told that you got that by treating an alkene with bromine, well, you take off the two bromines and you make an alkene where the bromines were. And so your starting material must have been this one. And I will probably get questions about the stereochemistry here Again, it's not really an issue for us until chapter five. There's still, that, that's going to be the last real uh, structural frontier that we'll have to cross. Uh, and I think that's chapter five, unless it's six. It's definitely not three or four, but we'll get there when we talk about uh, chirality and that type of stereoisomerism. If you're curious, I don't care if you know this right now, but as it turns out, the two bromines turn out trans. And there is reason, that one would be up and one would be down. There, the reason for that is, is because it, it, it's, it's dictated by the mechanism of the reaction. And the mechanisms of all of these reactions are known. And uh, that's what we use those curved arrows to communicate. And a lot of these are in your book. I'm not really going to emphasize that. It's not something I'm going to talk about too much. I don't mind if you've seen some correctly used arrows. Uh, if we have time, I might go over the mechanism of uh, HCl or HBr addition, since that's real fast and easy. It's just two steps. Just so you can see how those curved arrows are used. Up until now, you've only seen curved arrows used to help you find other resonance contributors for a given resonance form. And that's a completely bogus use of arrows, as I think I mentioned back then because arrows are used to show movement of electrons, and movement of electrons is exactly what is not happening in a resonance situation. So hopefully, I hope to have time to at least give you an example of what uh, such a mechanism looks like. Uh, but it's, it's not going to be something we use much. I won't say we'll never look at it, but it's not something I'm going to emphasize really greatly. Uh, good, so so much for halogenation. Make sense? Next one, how about we do hydrogenation? That one's real easy, you'll like that one. And just as its name applies, implies, hydrogenation involves adding hydrogen, hydrogen gas to be precise, H2. And in a typical hydrogenation reaction, you can start with any alkene, and typically, this uses hydrogen gas, usually in some excess. Uh, this reaction does require a catalyst. The most common one is palladium, PD. Uh, where's my periodic table? Anyone with a periodic table in front of them find PD in the D block? 
46 is sticking in my mind. I will die if palladium is element 46. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay, I won't literally die. Yeah, there it is, element 46. Um, but uh, this will also show, it's usually the nickel column. Any one of these would be fine. Nickel, palladium, or platinum. All of them make good uh, catalysts for hydrogenation. Uh, so there's something about those three metals. Uh, I must have said that enough in lecture. Uh, okay, so palladium or platinum or nickel, any of those three metals are fine. And in the end, it basically just reduces it to an alkane. So you just wipe out the double bond and put hydrogens there. And of course, if we go back to our friend one pentene, if you're using line angle drawings, you don't even need to show the hydrogens. So one pentene will become pentane. That's it. Now, if you're asked to go, I, I, uh, I mean, owl is evil, they might do this. Notice if you're asked to go in the other direction, you don't necessarily know where the double bond was. It could have been one pentene, it could have been either cis or trans two pentene. All of them will give you pentane when you hydrogenate them. So I don't know, just a word of warning there. Go, going backwards, there may be more than one correct answer. Going forwards, it's clear. You just wipe out the double bond and make it an alkane. Um, if we started with one methyl cyclohexene is what you may call that. Palladium, nickel, platinum, whatever you like. Then I would expect at the end, you would get one methyl cyclohexane. So the hydrogens are there. You can draw them in if you want to, but they're understood with a line angle drawing if you don't. That's, that's the great utility of line angle drawings. And like I, I've said, I don't really care if any of you guys use line angle drawings if, you, if you're not comfortable. I just ask that when you see them, you understand them and are able to interpret them properly. So it's a, fa it's a fairly simple reaction conceptually. You can call it a reduction reaction because actually it is. We were reducing the alkene to an alkane. And this is used all the time in the industry. Uh, ever read a food label and it says partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, right? Well, what that means is that they, uh, uh, is that they take uh, the, the, uh, the components of vegetable oils, which by the way are alkenes. They're actually uh, very long chain carboxylic acids, fatty acids with one or more alkene functional groups somewhere along the chain. And so they literally partially hydrogenate it, meaning that they reduce some of the double bonds to single bonds, but not all of them. And they just know how to do that in the food industry until they get the exact texture that they want. And now you've got that stuff in the middle of a Twinkie. That's basically how that works. Uh, one issue there that, that you've probably heard of, hopefully we'll mention this when we get to our chapter on lipids. Uh, what's the purpose of what? Partial hydrogenation? To get, of, of hydrogenation in general, well, you would use it if you wanted to get this compound, if you wanted to convert the alkene into an alkane. And, you know, th that might be the case if you're making a Oh, in, in food. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, the, uh, you then, what happens is you change the properties of, of that, uh, that long-chain unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, it, will, it will get a little, generally the saturated ones, the ones with few to no double bonds are solids at room temperature. And we'll go over all this in our chapter on um, uh, lipids. And the ones with more double bonds, other things being equal, tend to be liquids at room temperature. So you find those in your vegetable oil, your peanut oil, your you know, fill in the blank, olive oil. Uh, one issue I know that I can't resist mentioning now is the trouble is sometimes it will isomerize cis double bonds into trans double bonds. For some reason, the double bonds that are in uh, um, vegetable oils, you know, natural oil sources, for some reason, they're all cis double bonds. I don't know why that is. You would think they'd be trans because that's more stable, but they're actually cis. So some of those will get, uh, uh, during the partial hydrogenation process, some of those will get isomerized from cis to trans. And that's your trans fats. Those are the bad actors. So I guess they have ways of removing them now. Anyway, I'm sort of going far afield there. We'll get to that because I'm, I'm thinking we'll be doing a chapter on lipids as well.
good. So uh, other than that, it's fairly simple conceptually. Uh, questions so far? Hydration, also simple conceptually. Just don't confuse it with hydrogenation. Hydration means addition of water. And in a typical hydration reaction, you can start with any alkene. Again, I'm just drawing a generalized alkene over here. Uh, it's an addition of water. H2O, you can think of it as HOH. That's fine. And you also do need a, an acid catalyst. It's a different catalyst. We don't use a transition metal for this one. You need an acid catalyst. Sometimes they'll also write just H3O plus. That's fine. Same thing, right? If you add H plus and H2O, that's what you get, H3O plus. So generally some dilute aqueous acid. And in the end, one of the carbons will get OH and the other one will get H. And then you're done. So that's what it means to hydrate a double bond. You add water across it. And again, it does need an acid catalyst. If you just add an alkene and water together, nothing will happen. They'll just look at each other. You do need the protons to catalyze it. So again, this can be written H2O and H plus or H3O plus, or there's other variations on that too. But basically you're looking at it, a dilute aqueous acidic solution. And in the presence of an alkene that will make the alkene add water. So same thing. We start with our one pentene, which is soon to become our favorite uh, alkene. And you can write H2O, H plus or H3O plus, doesn't matter which. Uh, that is no longer my favorite alkene. What I meant to say I meant to say that we started with cyclohexene. That is definitely what I meant to say. And so you will turn the double bond into a single bond. One of those two formerly alkene carbons will get the OH and one will get the H. So I would expect you'd get cyclohexanol. And if you wanna draw the H on this carbon, you can, it's not wrong, but you don't have to. So now this carbon is a CH2. One of those hydrogens was there to begin with and the other one got added during the hydration. So I would expect you would get cyclohexanol. Uh, anyone wondering why I'm not bothering with a wedger dot bond here? Answer is it's the same thing. You just flip the molecule over. It's the same molecule. If you flip the OH with a wedge bond molecule over, then it becomes the one with the dotted bond. It's the same molecule. So nothing up my sleeve. Now, you'll notice I'm obviously playing tricks here with which uh, alkene I'm picking for my starting material. That's because there is an issue here that I'm deftly avoiding for now, but we'll get to on Wednesday. But uh, I'll at least allude to it before we go. But basically for now, my main point is uh, hydration of a double bond goes with an acid catalyst. And in a hydration, you convert the alkene double bond to a single bond and you add the elements of water across H and OH, the two uh, carbons. And I know I'm not fooling everyone, I, or I'm not fooling anyone rather, I should say. I think you already see what the issue is. Does it matter where you put the H and where you put the OH? And the answer is, if you cleverly choose your starting material, no. But will we see ones where it does matter? Yes, that's Wednesday and we'll learn how to take care of that on Wednesday. So for now, I'm choosing my starting materials carefully so that we don't run into that issue, but we'll get there, that's Wednesday. Let's at least learn about the reactions first. So that's hydration. Uh, let's do addition, I'll just say very generally of HX. So this is hydrohalogenation or uh, hydrosulfonation, something like that. And we're going to say that HX equals HCl or HBr 
or believe it or not, HI. Hydriotic acid is a very strong acid and will work here. Or H2SO4. And of course, H2SO4 is going to act like HOSO3H. In case you need a review of what the structure of sulfuric acid is, it's a small enough molecule. I think it will do you no harm to know its structure. I would hope that your Gen Chem professor mentioned it at some point. But sulfuric acid, H2SO4, looks like this. And one thing that jumps right out at us here, this, this, everything opens up other issues. It's interesting. So you'll notice that sulfur has well, has well over eight electrons around it. I think it's 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Yup, that's allowed. So the thing you, you need to know to understand that is all of your elements in the third row of the periodic table and below, all of those elements, and we'll mainly focus on the main group elements, the p-block elements, all of those elements can have more than eight electrons around them. They don't have to, but they can. Uh, but the, the flip side of that, I would say, is almost more important for you guys to know, which is this, which is that the elements in the second row of the periodic table most especially talking about carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, these guys, those elements can never, ever, ever have more than eight electrons around them, ever. There are no exceptions. But now the ones right underneath them, silicon, uh, what, sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, these guys can have more than eight electrons around them. They don't have to, but they can. But the ones in the second row, absolutely never. There should never, ever be more than eight electrons around any of those atoms. So that's the structure of sulfuric acid. And essentially, we think of it as HOSO3H. So that's what I mean by SO3H. And in the case you're wondering what that means or how that's all put together. So uh, any, of those, uh, any of those four strong acids will add across an alkene as well. And you'll add either H and Cl or H and Br or H and I or H and OSO3H. Those are the two pieces that you wind up adding across. Uh, interestingly, HI works in this case. HI is actually a very strong acid. HF does not work, but not for the same reason as before. Before, uh, fluorine wasn't working for us because F2 is too reactive. And it, 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 it just tears everything apart. It doesn't react in a controlled fashion. The reason HF doesn't make it onto this list is HF, as you might recall, is not a strong acid. HF is a weak acid. And so it's because the hydrogen fluorine bond is extremely strong. And so for that reason, it's pretty difficult to add HF across a double bond like this. But any of these other ones will work. So uh, if we do our cyclohexene again, take your pick. HI. I don't think you need anything else. I wouldn't add anything else. Let me just make sure I'm not contradicting anything. Nope, we're good. Uh, and I would expect that you would get iodocyclohexene. And of course, the hydrogen from the HI is also on the adjacent carbon. The adjacent carbon to CH2, one of those hydrogens was there to begin with. The other one we just added on, but I would expect to get, and of course that's not the only, you could draw the iodine wherever you like. They're all the same molecule. Uh, maybe just to tantalize you a little bit. Well, no, I won't tantalize you just yet. Let's, let's take a uh, trans 2-butene and treat that with sulfuric acid. And that will and that will add sulfuric acid across the double bond. So one of those two alkene carbons will get a hydrogen, the other one will get OSO3H. Or if you were to write OSO2OH, fine. SO3H or SO2OH, both are fine. So I would expect that would be the major product. But the rules are the same, right? The double bond becomes a single bond and we stick a hydrogen 
on one and whatever the rest of the molecule is on the other. And that's it. Those are the main uh, reactions. Now, uh, I see I'm out of time, but just to say, you know, what if I actually had given you something like this? Uh, in other words, an unsymmetrical alkene. What would happen if you treated that with HI? Would your major expected product be one iodopentane or two iodopentane? And the answer is it would be two iodopentane. You might get some one iodo also, but I'm sure the major product by a lot would be the two iodopentane. Why? That comes on Wednesday. Not a bad segue, huh? So anyway, have a great day and we'll see you all on Wednesday. And I will keep you informed as I figure things out about the exam. Some things might not uh, come to my mind until like Thursday, Friday, but don't worry. You're not gonna get to Monday morning not knowing what's gonna happen. At least I'll try my best. Have a great day.